All right, good morning, Southeast. How is everyone doing today? Good morning, good morning. So we are so honored to be here and to be celebrating. I know I kind of bust the bubble with Brother Smith's birthday. We're excited about that today. We're excited that the sun is out. So in Jesus' name, amen. Um, okay, so the opening scripture is going to be in Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Um, since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You must make a, an allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear God, let's open up with uh, prayer. Dear God, we just thank you, Lord. For the power of forgiveness, God, we thank you that we get to just lament to you and just leave it all at your altar, at you, at your feet, God. Um, we just thank you for that release, and we just love you so much, Lord. And we just pray, God, that your presence is here this morning. We invite you into this space, Holy Spirit. Be with us as we worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you all can stand, let's worship together. Yes. 
God, we just we just love you, God, and we just thank you, God, that we get to call you our Father. We thank you, God, that we get to build our life around you. We thank you, God, that you direct our path, God. We thank you for your will upon our life, and we're just so grateful that we get to worship and fellowship together, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen.
us, Lord. We just want your heaven to come. <laughs> just like this song is saying, we want your heaven to come, Lord. And we just thank you, God, for your heaven to come on earth as it is in heaven, God. We thank you again for your will be done in our lives, Lord. And I just pray, God, that you speak through Pastor Steve, Lord, who's going to bring the word to us this morning, God. Anoint him, God. And we thank you for your anointing on his life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, and it's great to see each and every one of you here today, and want to welcome those of you who are joining on Facebook Live as well, and uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, our psalm this morning is Psalm 150, and so go ahead and turn there with me. It is the last of the book of Psalms, so Psalm 150, and as you make your way there, any special praises, prayer requests, pains that you'd like to voice this morning? Brother Smith. Amen. Amen. He is faithful. Anyone else? Yeah, just praise the fact that it is Brother Smith's birthday today. Yeah. Yeah. So we're excited for that. Yeah. Amen. 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 I just want to praise the Lord for being able to spend some time with um, Hayden Crowell in the last couple of days. And uh, Rachel and Chuck Banks celebrated five years of marriage. And Oh, Tony? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. 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 All right. Anyone else? Praises or pains? Brother Mario? Good. Okay. Okay. I, you got, I didn't hear you with that car. Amen. Amen. We are too. Praise, praise the Lord. Anyone else? Sister Cunningham? Yes, uh, brother, sister. It's a blessing to be here one more time. We come to celebrate with um, our brother here. Uh, my son couldn't make it. He said, we have to have a representative. Oh, <laughs> Well, I'm grateful to God that he is a God that never leaves us. Amen. He never forsakes us. Amen. He's with us all the time. He walks with us. He talks with us. Amen. And I'm blessed. I'm Amen. blessed to be able to drive here. I uh, just came from El Central because I got a call from my son. Okay. <laughs> we got a representative. Uh, I, I just want to thank the Lord that he's allowed me to be here at South Beach. This is home. Amen. This is home. We've been blessed here. My husband's been here. My kids have been here. And most of us, God is here in this house. Amen. No matter where we are, Amen. we know that we have a God that yes. loves us and never will forsake us. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Anyone else? Well, just a quick update. Uh, so they started doing the asbestos removal in the sanctuary. And so that's why it sealed off. We didn't quite realize they were going to seal off the kitchen as well. We thought that they would, we'd still have access to the kitchen, uh, but they just sealed the whole thing. And so it's probably going to take a couple of weeks for them to get all the plaster out. And uh, I think they've got the carpet out or ready to come out. And so just thanking the Lord for um, providing and that we're going to be able to get everything taken care of. And so... Pray that God would bless all the workers who come here. 
And then the, uh, the other thing, uh, kind of an update, we want to pray for Pastor Tony and my Nisha. Tony is preaching up at the Hemet Church of the Nazarene today, and they're interviewing him after the service about becoming their pastor on a full-time basis. And so just pray that God would lead, guide, direct in that meeting. And uh, we would, uh, you know, we'd be sorry to see him go. And at the same time, we'd celebrate that the Lord is calling him and the Lord is placing him. And so it was being prayer for Pastor Tony and Minesha and the Hemet Church as they as they discuss things this afternoon. And any any other requests, praises, pains? Oh. If anybody does need to use the restroom, that one's closed, but the one in the office is open. And so you can make your way to the office. And uh, do you want to just make? Um, Pastor, we just mentioned the activity of children. Yes, uh, don't let your children go unaccompanied. There's lots to get into over there. Okay, uh, Psalm 150. Go ahead and turn there with me. Psalm 150. And we'll pray this together. And then feel free to pray out, and then I'll pray, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. So Psalm 150, and let us begin. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's continue to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful to be gathered together, Lord. And where you said two or three are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. And we're so grateful this morning presence is here. Lord, it's not about a building, but it's about your people, and we're so thankful, God, that you have allowed us to continue to meet, uh, even though the church building may not be um, inhabitable at this moment. Lord, we thank you, Father, for um, allowing funds to come in to have um, the demolition done, Lord, and we're so thankful, God, for your faithfulness and how you have uh, been with us on this journey. It's not our church. God, it's your church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We thank you, God, for each and every one that is here, Lord. And we pray, Father, a blessing upon each and every one. We thank you for Brother Smith, Lord, and for his life and for your faithfulness to him. Lord, thank you for all that he has done. And, Lord, we pray for a physical touch upon him and a special blessing upon him, Lord. And, Father, you pray that you bless his family, Lord. Thank you for each one of them. And, Father, we are just grateful for Brother Smith's um, time at this church and for his influence and testimony. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, Sister Mary being here with us today, Lord. Thank you so much for her testimony of your faithfulness. And, Father, we truly are so grateful for Dr. Cunningham, Sister Mary, and, and Lord, their whole family. And, Father, we're thanking you for the many good things that you have done in them and through them, Lord. We pray a blessing upon them, Father. And we pray for uh, Pastor Tony and for Maisha today as they're over in Hammond, Lord, as Pastor Tony is interviewing for this position of pastor and Hemet, Lord. We pray that you would just have your will and your way. And we thank you, God, for uh, your touch upon Pastor Tony and for how you have redeemed, restored, and, Lord, brought him uh, to this place of, of um, applying for this pastorship. And, Father, we give you all the glory because we know that you are not a second chance, Lord. We know that you are a God who is able, Lord, to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can even ask for him. We're so grateful, Father, for your call upon Pastor Tony's life. And, Lord, we just thank you for um, each and every one, as for the, uh, Brother Tony Martin, Lord, and for his being able to get into the doctor, Lord, to see about his lungs. And yeah. we pray, Lord, that you would just be with Tony and help him to be able to get the help that he needs and also that you help him to be strong and to be able to do what he needs to do. And, Father, we pray for Brother Mario and for his yeah. grandson, Lord. We just pray for your touch upon him. God, we ask that you would help him to, to know that he is not alone, that you're right there with him. And Father, thank you for being with Brother Mario and for helping him to be an influence over his family as well. And Lord, we are uh, praying that you would just continue to be with uh, each 
One more time, please allow us to come together one more time. One more time, one more time, please allow us to come together one more time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. He's allowed us to come together one more time. One more time, one more time. He's allowed us to come together one more time. One more time, one more time. He's allowed us. Come together one more time. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe us by. He's allowed us to come together one more time. One more time. One more time, he's allowed us to come together one more time. One more time, one more time, he's allowed us to come together one more time. Okay. Uh, you know, they say that God is, speaks to us, that we need to listen. Uh-huh. Okay. It's found in, in uh, Psalm 48 5. Sit thee still, O God, for the works of the Lord, and what his hands have, have done. Who is there now that there will be able to lift up a hand? And believe me, just, just out of the blue, as I was this morning listening. To the word of God, it just came to me. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this good day and for your blessings upon us and your presence with us today. Thank you for how you have gathered us together. You have brought us from so many different places, but we're here because of you. And we are united in Christ Jesus because of you and because of what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. You're our maker. You're our creator. You know us better than ourselves. You're more mindful of us than we are of you. And we're just thankful for how you look after us. Thank you for the gift of life. You give us breath each and every day. And Lord, were it not for you, we'd have no breath. We'd have no life. And we thank you that you give us purpose. You don't just have us here, but you have us here on purpose. That we might reflect your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace to each other. That we might reflect you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to live into your purpose for us. And thank you for how you have attended to us this past week. Thank you for how you have been with with uh, Brother Reuben and how you have watched over him and how you brought him through the heart attack, brought him through the surgery and have him here today. And thank you for his sister who is here with him. And well, Lord, we pray your blessing, your anointing upon him. Lord, we know that you have him here for a reason. And we pray that you would empower him to live into that purpose, Lord, of glorifying you and reflecting your goodness to all those around him. And then, Father, we thank you for Sister Cunningham being with us. Thank you for bringing her here today. And pray your blessing upon her whole household and family. Thank you for Brother Smith. And thank you for his word to us today. And thank you, Father, that you are a God who speaks to us. And you wake us in the night. And you speak to us in the afternoon. And you are constantly uh, ministering to us. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And, Lord, we pray that you would be with all of the unspoken requests this morning. Lord, every one of us has persons, has situations that are heavy upon our heart today. And Lord, we bring each and every one to you. And we look to you and we trust you. Pray that you would be with Pastor Tony today and my niche as they interview with the Hemet Church. We ask your anointing upon that time together. Let your will be done, Lord. And we see the gifts and the graces that you have bestowed upon Tony. And we thank you for how you are at work in his life and through his life to draw others unto you and to build them up in Christ. And Lord, we pray your will be done. And we're going to celebrate what you do. And then, Father, we pray that you would be with all those who are dealing with loss today. And we pray, Father, that you would comfort and that you would provide your peace. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring your healing and your hope. Lord, be with those who are dealing with illnesses. Uh, we lift up Tony to you, and we pray for him. We pray that you would continue to be with Angel. We celebrate what you're doing in his life and the good report on Angel. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Maria and with Mario Jr. Keep your hand upon each of them, and, Lord, draw them unto you. And we pray that they would know your peace and the depths of your peace. And, Lord, we, we see so much brokenness around us, and, again, we cry out for your peace and for your kingdom to come. We are most thankful that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we confess our sins to you, and we confess that we continue to fall short of your glory. And we pray, Father, that you would forgive us for those things that we didn't do, that you are moving us towards, and 
We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for things that we did do that we know we shouldn't have. We pray, Father, that you would cleanse and purify us by the blood of Christ, and that by your Spirit you would empower us to be more and more Christ-like. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to trust you wholeheartedly, uh, to hold nothing back from you, but to live lives relinquished to you. And then, Lord, we pray that you would help us to grow, to increase in our love for one another, that we would bear with each other, that we'd walk with each other, that we'd encourage each other, that we'd pray for each other. And Lord, may your light shine in our lives and through our lives that others might come to know you, might come to know the peace, the hope, the joy, the salvation that we have in you. Thank you for those that you have placed in our lives who help us to know you better and who encourage us along the way. And again, Lord, help us to be that person to someone else. Lord, we pray for our nation, our city, our world. It seems like everywhere we look, there is heartache, there is brokenness, there is strife, there is hatred, there's pain. We pray, Father, that you'd move in the midst of all of it and that you would accomplish your will and that you would move leaders to be humble, to seek you and to seek your ways. And Lord, we pray that you would use us as your people to truly be a light in the midst of the darkness. Do such a work in us here on this corner but also your church, your people across the street, in downtown and all parts of the globe. Lord, all the different places where we gather to worship you, do such a work within us that you are undeniable, that it is evident that you are the God who saves, that you are the God who transforms, that you are the God who gives hope. Uh, Lord, grant us your spirit, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen 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 well um, i want to thank you again for being here offering plates are in the back thank you for your faithful stewardship with all that god has blessed you with and entrusted to you and um, we don't have any major kind of announcements in terms of it's kind of business as usual zoom tonight uh don't know when we'll be back in yet for friday night so we're kind of everything's kind of on hold there uh and uh, nothing major upcoming but we have one big thing today, and that is Brother Smith has a birthday. And uh, is it Wednesday, Brother Smith? Is that the day? 13. And uh, so we praise God and, and Sister Cunningham as well. <clears throat> so that's the birthday row right there. And uh, But Brother Smith, would you come forward for a moment? he's coming we're just uh, uh while he's coming we're going to take a moment just to uh, uh talk about brother smith and uh, his influence at this church i don't know if any of you know that brother smith has been involved in this church for over 50 years and this morning we wanted to honor him he's taught sunday school he has sang in a men's group he has served on the church board as secretary treasurer for many years He's provided many a smoked turkey for our Thanksgiving dinners, and he's provided for Sunday morning dinners as well. He has been a source of wisdom throughout the years. He has been a faithful servant of Christ and serving alongside Sister Gussie, and so faithfully his wife has been such a, a faithful husband and father. And um, he's also been a part of many of the church programs, such as the men's uh, retreat in the fall as the men have gone and um, just a strong supporter of the church in every way, a, a churchman that um, we are just so thankful for. And so I'm gonna let Pastor Steve um, yeah, go ahead know. and let say. Let me read the plaque. So Southeast Church of the Nazarene Distinguished Service Award is proudly presented to Brother James Smith, who has faithfully served the Southeast Church of the Nazarene for over 50 years. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us do. And Brother Smith, we praise God for how you've been doing all that Christ has prepared in advance for you to do. So we're just so thankful 
and so blessed by you, and you've given us a lot of wisdom, but most of all, we're grateful for your godly example. And I just pray God's blessing to continue to rest upon you and upon your family. Thank you. And uh, also remember that God gave me uh, the will and sort of pushed me to where he wanted me to be. And uh, I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. Amen. So, and I thank all the, the members of the church who have been here and, and uh, helped keep this church is still being open. And it's been God's hand that kept this church going. Amen. 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 And the people uh, who are dedicated to serving the Lord. Thank you. So, and and I, I thank you for this time. Amen. 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 Well, we love you, Brother Smith. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, there are people that were in his Sunday school class. Pastor Tony was one, is that correct? Pastor Tony in one of your Sunday school classes? Yes. And Sister Alex, Brother Max, children, and um, Sister Lynch, and countless others that were in uh, Brother Smith's Sunday school class. He's had some influence on their lives, so we just thank God that the ministry has gone forward this morning, especially as Pastor Tony has been at Hemet. So yes, I believe they want to get your picture, but just move past this post right here. All right, well today we are today we are in Revelation chapter 16. Uh, but before you turn there, I have one question I want you to answer, uh, to ponder on. And so the question is this, how do you dress for an earthquake? How do you dress for an earthquake? So go ahead. I, I mean, I'm not predicting anything, but if you knew that today was going to be an earthquake, how would you dress for an earthquake? All right, steel-toed shoes. Talk about it for a moment. All right, turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. I hope you don't need any of that gear today, but Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard a voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land. And ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. 
And then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments. You who are holy, you who are and who, who were the holy one, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, and they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful uh, for your word, and we pray that you would speak afresh to us, that you would give us ears to hear you, that our hearts would be open and receptive to you, that our minds would be humble and obedient to you. Lord, have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know this part of the sermon already, but I'm going to remind you, I'm going to preach it anyways. Uh, how many revelations? One revelation. So take the S off the end of it. The S isn't there. It is just one revelation. Lots of scenes to it, lots of parts to it, but one revelation. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and his victory. And you might be thinking, why does that need to be revealed? Well, that needed to be revealed because the times were so dark, it was so difficult to see that Jesus was actually victorious. The time revelation occurred or was given was about A.D. 95. And during that time period, the Roman emperor, his name was Domitian. And Domitian was demanding that everybody across the empire worship him. He was demanding that people would offer sacrifice to him, offer incense to him. And if you didn't do it, it was costly. And it could cost you your life. And you would be shut off from everything. And so the church of A.D. 95, they were experiencing this, and it was a time of great threat. It was a time of seduction. It was a time of fear, and their main pastor, John, he had been exiled to a prison camp on an island called Patmos, and that was part of the persecution, that Rome took their pastor from them and put him in a prison camp. But John continued to worship the Lord, and as he worshiped, the Lord gave him this revelation and gave him a way to get it to his churches. And so he was able to get the, get the revelation to his churches and to be able to share with them, to encourage them, to help them to see, no, it may be a dark time, but Jesus is victorious. And Jesus is the one who reigns. And so you should orient your life towards Jesus and his throne rather than to the throne in Rome. And so the whole thing is to to motivate, to share with his people, to help encourage them,
to stay faithful to Christ in the midst of a time of intense persecution, a time of great seduction, a time of incredible fear and threat. And some of them, they lost their lives. Uh, we read about a guy by the name of Antipas, who was a martyr, who was executed because of his testimony to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the irony is that he was victorious too. That victory does not mean that somehow you're going to escape with your life. What victory meant was that you were going to be faithful at all costs. And there was no way that Rome was going to seduce you, trick you, deceive you, or coerce you into worshiping the emperor. That at all costs, you were going to stay faithful. And so Antipas, while the world thought that he was foolish, he was faithful. And in being faithful, he experienced God's victory. So, so Revelation is written to motivate this faithfulness. It is given that in the midst of a dark time, Christ is actually victorious and reigning. And so stay faithful. Now, a lot of times people will look at Revelation and try to figure it out in terms of, okay, how close are we to the end? And everybody gets it wrong. And, and so that's the wrong question, in a sense, in terms of where are we at? How close are we to the end? You know, don't go there. Okay, the way we've been approaching it is how is this helpful to the people of AD 95? Okay, because they're facing Rome, they're facing threat, they're facing persecution. So getting some map of the next 2,000 years wasn't exactly going to help them get through the next day. And so our question is kind of, how would this have helped them get through the next day? How would this have helped them get through the threat of not being able to put bread on their table because they worship the Lord instead of the beast? How would this help them get through the next week, get through the next month, get through the next year when all they could see is the threat of Rome? And they would hear and know of brothers and sisters who had been executed for worshiping Jesus. And so how did it help them? And I think as we discover how it helped them, we might actually find it helping us to stay faithful in our times. And maybe our times aren't as threatening, although some might say they are. And depending on where you live, they just might be. They're certainly seductive in terms of if you don't compromise with the culture, if you don't compromise with the world, you're risking being cut off, being alienated. And so how did it help them? It might just help us in the same way. Now, a number of you have been making this journey uh, through Revelation, and you've noticed that seven shows up a lot, that there was a sevenfold spirit before the throne, that Jesus told John to send these messages to the seven churches. Seven, kind of completeness, fullness, heavenly number. We have also noticed that seven shows up in terms of this cycle of I don't know, judgments or plagues. And so remember, John saw God seated on the throne. He saw the lamb standing in the center of the throne. And God had in his hand, what? A scroll. How many seals were on the scroll? Seven. Seven seals, one scroll, one revelation. And the scroll is the execution of God's will. And the concern was that there's no one worthy to open the scroll, to undo the seals so that God's will could be done. And then John realizes it's pointed out to him that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb who was slain in his standing, Jesus, is victorious and worthy. And so Jesus opens the seven seals. And as those seals are open, we begin to see judgments taking place. And so there is a white horse running, bent on conquering. And there's a red horse that's bent on violence and bloodshed. And we saw these horses running, that there is one that is famine and one that is plague. And, and the outcome of these four horses running, a fourth of the population 
dies. Death comes. And then we heard under plague number five that, or with plague number five, souls who had been martyred, people who had been martyred, their blood was crying out to God from, from the altar in heaven, saying, how long until you make things right on the face of the earth? And then seal number six is open, and there is this earthquake that shakes things like never before. And, you know, just incredible shakeup. And then we get seal number seven. And we think seal number seven is going to be over, that judgment will finally come, that justice will finally be in place. And seal number seven, we discover that there's seven angels with seven trumpets, and we got seven to go through again. And so we move through the seven trumpets, and, and angel number one blows trumpet number one, and there's wrath on the earth, and angel number two blows trumpet number two, and there is God's wrath on the sea, and angel number three blows trumpet number three, and there is wrath on the fresh water, and then there's wrath on the sun with angel number four. And, and so we move through seven again, and we get to number seven, and we feel that that finally victory has come and it's over. And the next thing you know, we get our third seven. And we're not there yet. And we get our third seven. And now we have seven angels with seven bowls of wrath to be poured out upon the earth. And this seventh is the final seven. That finally God's wrath is poured out completely upon the face of the earth. Now, you may be feeling like, oh man, that is, that's frightening. And that's horrible. And I get that. But I think the thing I'm starting to learn is that maybe that's what's needed. Do we actually need God to put things right? Do we actually need God's wrath, God's judgments, to come and to correct things and to bring justice to the face of the earth. And so I'd like for you to, to begin to revisualize the wrath of God rather than it just being torment and anger and punishment, to begin to think about it more in terms of solution, more in terms of God finally making things right and straightening out the crooked and beginning to level off places that are rough and rugged and ought to be smooth. And so, I don't know if you want to think about it this way, God knocking the edges off the earth. That, you know, sometimes we can get an edge on us and we can get an edge on us and we're not fit for anybody. And we need somebody to kind of knock our edges off and make us a little bit smoother so that we can interact with people well. Well, what if God's judgment is just that in a large scale? They're kind of knocking the edges off so that there can actually be peace. And there's not going to be any peace until God brings forth his judgment upon sin. God brings forth his justice to the face of the earth. So look with me to chapter 16. And I want us to take a kind of a walk through and, well, maybe one more comment as we go. So there's a couple of different ways of looking at these three sets of seven. So we got the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath. So they're kind of spoken of as cycles. And so you go through this cycle of seven three times. And one way of looking at it is that each time through the cycle, it's kind of like a, a, a new time around. So it's not identical, but it's kind of building on each other. And so some think of it maybe more linearly in terms of we go through this seven, and then we go through this seven, and we go through this seven. Okay, and, and maybe one way to think about it is like you are running laps. And so you got to go through this lap, and then you make it around this lap, and then you do a third lap. And so you're constantly kind of building, and it looks somewhat the same territory because you're running the lap, 
but yet it's genuinely new. The second lap is not the first lap. The third lap is not the second lap. Okay, so that's, that's one way that it's looked at. And so you're making progress all along the way. You go through this seven, then you go through this seven, then you go through this seven. So some look at it that way. Others look at it that maybe it's not about going through this seven and going through this seven and going through this seven. Maybe it's looking at the seven and this is the first time you look at it and this is what you see. And then you come back and you look at it a little bit longer and you see the seven, but a little bit different details begin to come out. And then you look at it a third time and it's not that it's something different, like your third lap is different from the first lap. You're still looking at the same thing, but now more details come out. And you're seeing something a little bit more different or a little bit more clearly. So, I don't know, have you ever looked out, looked at a picture and you thought you understood everything that was in the picture? And then you come back and you look at the picture again. Picture hasn't changed, but now you're seeing different details in the picture. And then you come back and you look at it again and the picture hasn't changed, but now you're seeing something different or you're seeing something more clearly when you look at it again. Okay, some would say that that's what's going on with these three cycles, that it's not that you have kind of three different pictures, that the whole thing is one picture, but as John looks at it each time, he begins to see different details or some details get bolder. Than, they, than he had noticed before. So honestly, I don't know which way to go. Okay, but one thing that everybody agrees on, it intensifies. That as John sees it, whether we're in the third cycle, like the third lap, the third lap gets more intense than the first lap. Or whether it's the third look at a picture, the picture hasn't changed, but the seeing of the picture is changing. Whichever way you go, it intensifies. So let me just call your attention to a few things where we see this intensification taking place. First of all, we see the depth of the resistance to God and to Christ as Lord. So I don't know if you picked up on it, but I think I heard about three times in this last vision where people were cursing God. And what, what begins to be revealed each time you look at it is just the, in, the intensity of resistance or rejection of God and the Lamb. But the other thing that becomes more and more clear is the decisive and certain victory of Christ. That as you look at it, not only do you see the, the resistance more and more clear and it intensifies, but you also see the decisive and the certain victory of God and the Lamb. That comes through clearer and clearer and clearer. And so I, I kind of step back from that for a moment. I think, okay, how would this have helped them? Kind of moving through these cycles and beginning to see this more and more clearly. And, and I think it's kind of a message to, to them that, look, things are going to get more intense. Like you think people are set against you now? You have no idea how deep the resistance to you is because you follow the Lamb. And you're going to discover it, and you're going to feel it, and it's going to, it's going to, it's going to hurt. But at the same time, you think you're victorious now? You don't even know victory yet. That Christ's, Christ's victory is certain, and it's decisive, and this world is not up for grabs. Christ already claims it. Victory is decisive. And so I can just think how that would empower John's people as they, as they begin to realize this, like, wow, you know, the dragon really is against us, but the dragon really is defeated. And so 
And so then I began to think, okay, maybe we need to realize that. And as we, as we, be, as we live, we discover like, wow, I had no idea things were this bad. I had no idea there was such resistance. I had no idea that there was such such disdain and rejection of God and his ways and, and Christ and his victory. But at the same time, he's victorious. And things aren't up for grabs. That it's already decided and that he's the one who reigns. And so that gives kind of a power and a boldness to stay faithful in the face of a defeated, angry dragon. Because no matter how angry the dragon is, the dragon is defeated. So, so I just think moving through the cycle those three times kind of presses that truth you know, deeper and deeper into John's readers, deeper and deeper into us. Okay, so, so moving through. So let's go to chapter 16 and the first angels, uh, verse 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl of wrath on the land. And what was the result? Ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. And so those who, it's, it's ironic, those who compromised in order to survive, they're the ones who are actually plagued with painful sores. When you place your trust in the Lamb, you experience peace. Life may be hard, but you have peace. But when you compromise with the beast in order to survive, then your life has no peace. And instead you have sores, you have boils, and it is painful. And what does this remind you of? Well, if you go back to Exodus in chapter 9, Plague number six, boils. And so just as, just as those Exodus plagues were judgments on the gods of Egypt, the injustices of Egypt, to bring about a new day of liberation and salvation and peace for God's people, that's what we're seeing with the plagues, with the judgments in Revelation. So it reminds us of of Egypt. Uh, number three, the second angel poured out his bowl. Verse three, the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. And then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the holy one because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Remember back to Egypt, what was plague number one? Turning the Nile to blood. Here we have the seas turned to blood. Here we have the rivers and the fresh water turned to blood. And now we'll move on to the fourth angel, verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire, and they were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, and they refused to repent and glorify him. So fourth angel was pouring it out on the sun, and the sun became scorching hot. And what did people do? They refused to repent, refused to glorify God, but instead they curse the name of God. Um, look back with me to chapter 6 of Revelation. And chapter 6 of Revelation, notice verse 7 and 8. So 6, 7, and 8. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse, its rider's name Death, and Hades was following close behind. They were given power over what? A fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, so a fourth of the earth. Now go with me to chapter 8, and let's pick it up at verse 6. Chapter 8, verse 6. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. 
The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Verse 8. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Verse 10, the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on a third of the springs of water. Go down with me to verse, a third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned black, a third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. So we went from a fourth to a third. And again, here in chapter 16, it's all. Look at verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl in the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every, not a third, but every living thing in the sea died. And so we have this, this totality taking place. Um, look with me at verse 10 of chapter 16. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Total darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Darkness in terms of lostness, darkness in terms of evil, darkness in terms of rebellion against God, but the kingdom of the beast, the throne of the beast, his kingdom was nothing but darkness. And there was the refusal to repent, but to just curse God. Keep going with me. Look at verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And so we've seen in the Exodus, we saw the drying up of the sea for them to pass through. Now we have the drying up of the Euphrates, but now this time kings will come to bring destruction. Three evil spirits that looked like frogs were given. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So they're going to be deceptive. They're going to be lying. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. And look with me down at verse 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And so there is a vision here of this incredible battle that is going to take place, and it looks like everybody is going to come and battle against the people of God, but God's people are already victorious because of Christ Jesus. And what will happen in this battle is that they will basically implode on each other. And the, the best way I know how to imagine it is the story of Joseph being sold by his brothers down to Egypt. And the brothers meant it for evil. The brothers were trying to get rid of Joseph. They were envious of him. They were jealous of him. They hated him. They wanted to rid the earth of him. And so they did their evil, and God took their evil, and God repurposed it for salvation. And so that all this stuff happened to Joseph, but God was with him, and the outcome was that Joseph actually saved his family, and all Egypt was blessed by Joseph, and when questioned about it, Joseph told his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. See, I think that's what's going on here with this battle of Armageddon, that the defeated dragon, the beast, the false prophet, they are deceiving the kings of the earth to move them to battle to attack God's people. And God is over this whole thing. And so somehow out of all of this, God is actually going to bring about a new heavens and a new earth that God is going to bring salvation. God is going to bring his justice. And so when you hear people talk about this battle, don't get struck with fear. Don't get consumed by it. Just realize that the God, that God is able to take 
what's meant for evil and to actually bring good out of it. Bring about salvation. We do not have to live in fear. Okay, stay with me. Verse 17, seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it had ever occurred since man had been on the earth, so tremendous was the quake. The great city, people debate about what city that is, Jerusalem, Babylon, Rome, the great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath, judgment. And every island fled away, the mountains could not be found, from the sky came huge hailstones, there's another Exodus plague, and look at the last line, they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. So we see this rising intensification, this deep resistance to God, but ultimately Christ is victorious. Now there's one verse in here that I want us to focus on as we wrap up. Go back up with me to verse 15. Verse 15, Jesus speaks up. Verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes on, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Do you hear it? Make sure you're dressed for the earthquake. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him or stays clothed so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. See, that's where my question really comes from this morning. How do you dress for an earthquake? How do you dress for plagues? Like it's going to be a, a plague full day. How do you dress? And it's really kind of a, a helpful thing to think about. Um, look all the way back with me to Exodus chapter 12. And Exodus chapter 12 is where they get their instructions for getting out of Egypt. And Moses has announced the death angel is coming. The firstborn will be taken. And he begins to give the people instructions about what they're to eat and how to be ready. And I just want you to see the clothing instructions. So 1211, this is how you are to eat it, the meal. Make sure you're dressed properly for eating this Passover meal. You eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So there's clothing instructions that you make sure that you got your cloak on, that it's tucked in, that you got your sandals on, that nobody's going to have to wait for you, that you are ready to go because salvation is coming. Okay, so then go with me to Isaiah chapter 61. And we get another kind of clothing example. So 61, it's, it's about what the Lord is going to do to bring about justice. And in verse 10, Zion is speaking. The people of God are speaking in verse 10. So Isaiah 61, 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Now, I think that would be good clothing for an earthquake to be clothed with garments of salvation and to be arrayed in a robe of righteousness. And God provides this clothing. Okay, look with me to Romans chapter 13. Just trying to get this clothing thing pressed upon you. So chapter 13 of Romans, and we're going to pick it up at, let's see, where did I want, at verse 14. Well, I'll start at verse 11. So Romans 13, 11, do this, love one another, understanding the present time. 
The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside, take off the clothing of the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, one more passage about clothing. Uh, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. This is the passage that Sister Christina read at the beginning of the service. And we're going to pick it up at verse 12. So Colossians 3, 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Are you dressed for an earthquake? See, I think, I think the way you dress for an earthquake, I think the way that we dress for these plagues is that we make sure that every day we put on Christ. That every day we clothe ourselves with the compassion of Christ, with the mercy of Christ, with the grace of Christ. That every day we clothe ourselves with this loving attitude of Christ Jesus. So that it's the love of Christ that compels us through the day. Um, just trying to imagine what it would have been like back then. And I imagine that oftentimes when you begin to realize that the beast is after you, how do you start to act? Like a beast. That if I have a dragon chasing after me, I start to act like a dragon. That if I have a beast that is trying to track me down, I start to become beastly, thinking that the way I'm going to beat the beast is to outbeast the beast. And you start to you start to live that way. And that's just and so I'm thinking that in the middle of this, to be ready, you know, to be dressed appropriately for the earthquake, to be dressed appropriately for the plagues, that it takes extra care to make sure that you don't become like the beast that's tracking you down. And that you actually clothe yourself with Christ and the armor of Christ rather than acting like the beast and clothing yourself with the armor of the beast. That that's how you stay dressed and ready, by staying clothed with the love of Christ. And that's, I guess that's, you know, it took a long time to get here and I apologize for that. But I think that's the word for today. That in a context in which you find resistance and people cursing God and people cursing you for loving God, don't return curse for curse. Clothe yourself with Christ and so that you show compassion and love and instead of being jaded by a world that's against you, we're actually formed by the love of Christ Jesus. And so that we are clothed with his compassion and his graciousness and his love for one another, and also his love for a lost world that he sacrificed him for to save. And so one of the ways that we work at clothing ourselves is through communion. And so we put on, if you will, Jesus. We become, by his grace, what we eat. And so we take his broken body, and we take his shed blood, as an effort, as an invitation, Jesus, clothe me. Dwell within me and clothe me with your love and your compassion so that I reflect you rather than reflecting the beast that's against me. And so I invite you to stand, and if it's your desire to put on the righteousness of Christ, then this is for you. 
Come and receive. Return to your seats once everyone is served. Then we'll take communion together. And Christina and Vonda, if you would come and if you would lead us in, um, I think it was I Build My Life. And as they sing, I invite you to come and you could join with them in song as well. Amen. Let's worship together. And I invite you to come. Kind of move around this way and then back.
disciples. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. <laughs> Likewise, took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take a drink. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Amazing grace, how sweet the our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we do have birthday celebrations and so everyone is welcome to stay. I know we have Sister Mary and a Brother Smith. They're both on the same day. Do we have any other March birthdays? All right, let's sing. March birthdays? Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, brothers and sisters. Happy birthday.